Okay. <clears throat> Usually, I give this sort of presentation <clears throat> uh, uh, at the beginning when I when we start talking about spatial structure. That is before I talk about uh, beta diversity. But at this point, it will be just fine. In any case. <clears throat> My main message here is that spatial structures are very important for uh, the understanding of processes in ecosystems. And actually, this goes back to the 1980s and early 1990s, where uh, the general recommendation of statisticians was to remove spatial structures from data because they created autocorrelation in data, and that was bad. Well, I wrote a paper in uh, 1993, I think, in ecology, uh, where I said, wait a minute, spatial structures are very important for, or, for the functioning of ecosystems. Indeed, can you imagine an ecosystem where organisms would be located at random? And uh, I described for half a page the consequences, the absurd consequences that this would lead to. So I said after that, uh, if you remove the spatial structure before analyzing the, your data, you are throwing out the baby with the water of the bath. And uh, we should not do that. If we want to understand what is really going on in ecosystems, we should keep the spatial structures into the analysis and the spatial structures, even if we analyze them for their own sake, they are a proxy in formation for processes that are going on in ecosystems. And uh, that paper turned out to be one of the, my, my most highly cited papers. It seems that the message has been heard. And now uh, statisticians are very quiet about their uh, previous uh, suggestion of removing spatial structures before doing anything else. We have not heard uh, about that. So uh, I think that now the new trend is to keep the spatial structures in the analysis, following uh, the geographers who had been doing that for a longer time, a longer time than ecologists. So I will here describe why spatial structures are important and what can be their origin. Spatial structures can happen in different ways, and we will examine some of these ways. Uh, now, this, uh, the study of spatial structures is, uh, is well considered, and it is included in the, uh, in the name of two branches, a branch of ecology and a branch of genetics, called landscape ecology and landscape genetics, where we study the spatial variation of species composition or of genetic structures uh, of, of individuals or local population throughout the landscape. And uh, here that variation is called beta diversity. And uh, I think that uh, in genetics it can be called also genetic beta diversity. Now, why do we want to understand and model a spatial community structure uh, when we study species assemblages? observed at sampling sites. <clears throat> we know that this is, uh, it takes a lot of effort, planning, energy, time, money to do that. Why do we do that? Are we uh, sick in our head to go to all this trouble, going to sample or rebatted mites in clouds of black flies and so on? Uh, you know, it, it is a hard job that we are doing. Why do we do that? It's because Ecologists firmly believe that species assemblages are the best response, available, uh, response variable available to us to estimate the impact of changes in ecosystem, especially in our so-called modern times where the impact is produced by man. Uh, and these impacts can best be studied by asking the species that live in ecosystems. In the old days, a government agency that wanted to know something about changes in ecosystem would ask an ecologist to come along and they would bring him to some area and they would walk around the area and they would say, mm -mm, mm -mm, very interesting. Yes, maybe there was some change. Oh, there is a beaver there. He must be responsible for the change. Well, we don't do that 
in this way anymore. We send graduate students full of energy to the field to collect uh, mites or insects or plants or look at birds, mammals, and so on. And we ask the organisms that live in the ecosystem what they think about the ecosystem. And by redoing the sampling at different times, we can measure then the response of the species to the changes in the ecosystem. That's the way we do it in modern days. So it is the best uh, response variable available to us. It is better than sending a so-called specialist uh, to uh, tell us everything about it. The difficulty, of course, is that species assemblages form multivariate data tables. And we have seen in this short course how we can analyze multivariate data tables in different ways by PCA, but not in any in any possible way. We have to do it in a careful way after transformation of the data. And our <clears throat> careful uh, uh, attention that has to be given to the way these analyses are carried out. And uh, we tried to give you some information, some basic ideas about how to do these analyses in this short course. Uh, also, for testing. Uh, <coughs> Uh, it is more difficult to test hypotheses from multivariate data table, but we have seen that we can do that very well using canonical analysis. Uh, in uh, landscape genetics, it is the same thing, but with uh, genetic data describing uh, local populations observed at georeference sampling sites. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so, we talk about Beta diversity in general as the variation in species composition among sites. We can look along a temporal uh, gradient, a, a temporal series of uh, sampling the same site and talk about ge temporal beta diversity. And in uh, genetics, we can talk about genetic beta diversity. This term is becoming to be used to represent the sort of diversity through space or through time. OK. Now uh, we will uh, look at the kind of organization that we can have of, uh, the, of the communities through space. What kind of spatial structures do we have? This is a prairie of daisies. It was, uh, I took this uh, picture in a small island off the coast of uh, Brittany in Finisterre. And uh, that represented, for me, something close to a random distribution of daisy, of the points. When I saw that prairie, I said, yes, I must take a picture of that. Now, uh, there is a trick to that picture. It looks very homogeneous and uh, random, but otherwise homogeneous. Now, when I took that picture, I was standing in a small gravel road. And I knew that in the back, there was a hedge shrub. But I did not frame, I framed my picture so that you couldn't see the, the shrubs. On the left, there was another dirt road. I did not include it in the picture. And on the right, there was a medieval church that I did not include either. So I only took the picture at that, at that scale, this uh, few maybe four meters, uh, four or five square meters of the prairie. And that looked random. So my message to you is that if I had taken the picture by zooming out or by backing up, uh, I would have included these other items of the landscape. And you would have seen that it was not a uniform distribution at all. It was a patch. So a uniform distribution or a patch, it depends on the scale of perception. So the scale at which we do the, our observation is very important. And this is my first introduction to the idea of scale that we'll, we'll look at in more detail tomorrow with multi-scale analysis. But this is the message of that picture. Uh, <coughs> Our, yeah, our perception varies with the scale of observation. Sometimes we have spatial structures that appear. 
this is a picture that I took <coughs> at uh, Stonehenge in uh, southern England. Uh, Stonehenge, actually, it, this is a drawing that was uh, on the side of the road at the, when it was originally constructed about 5,000 years ago. It was a double or triple circle of stones where you have standing stones related by uh, lintels here. And these uh, pieces of rock have holes that fit into uh, pins of, uh, of, the, uh, of stone left into these carved stones. Uh, and the whole thing is solid because of this uh, pinning of the, these stones into that. So that was uh, the structure. And uh, it is one of the morals of the world to still have access to this uh, structure standing uh, 5,000 years after it was built. We, uh, and there are big discussions among uh, archaeologists as to what was the purpose of this circle of stones, especially after they found out that each of these stones had been ca carried from kilometers away. They know where each stone comes from, from the chemistry of the stones. And so why did they do, did they, did they go through all this trouble to construct this structure? So it is very nice. But when you visit it, uh, this is one of the standing stones. And you have a, a lintel on top of it here. It is a bit eroded after 5,000 years. But what do you see in there? Do you see any spatial structure? Uh, it's right in front of you. Any idea? Lichens, right. Uh -huh. You have lichens here at the top of that stone and nothing at the bottom. Why is that? As soon as we I ask why, you will Im immediately try to imagine reasons that uh, could explain that. For instance, is it that the cows in the pasture are rubbing against the stone? Maybe. But uh, maybe that was the case in the old days, but not anymore, because now there is a fence around it. The cows are kept away. Uh, could it be that the top of the stone is protected by the lintel, and when there is dry uh, temperature, rare in the south of England, uh, then maybe this dries out, but this remains wet because of this cover? I don't know. Maybe. Or there may be some other reason. Maybe there is some ghost that comes uh, during the night and rubs off the lichens. Maybe. And we are approaching uh, Halloween. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's important. Uh, it's all sorts of reasons. Whatever the reason is that we have a spatial structure, and we try to imagine reasons why we have these spatial structures. <coughs> and we can, we can discuss them endlessly, or we can uh, design experiments to be carried out, uh, not directly on these stones, but on uh, makeshift uh, stones outside the stone circle, of course and see if we can reproduce the phenomenon under different circumstances or in different countries or what. So it's fun. <laughs> it's interesting to do. Uh, and what I will try to uh, describe here is that there are, uh, <clears throat> that spatial structures in community in, indicate that some process has been at work to create them. That's why we are interested in spatial structures. It's because there is a process and we can try to discover this process. And when we have a hypothesis, we have numerical ways of testing these hypotheses. Does it make sense that it is this process that created the spatial structures that we observe? So spatial structures are a proxy information and in basic information that tells us that something has been going on. And it is left to us to discover what this process is. So it is a game of uh, detective or less, that we are doing. Here is a picture representing a small area uh, in, uh, in Quebec. It is near a large lake called uh, Two Mountain Lake. And uh, here is a small town <coughs> called Vigo along the highway going from Montreal in that way to Ottawa in that way. And uh, in this small village, we could imagine that the graduate student would might want to do a sampling for a master's thesis, for instance. And here uh, I got this uh, map from Google Maps. 
and I added a red line on the map, that could be a sampling transect. And, <clears throat> but then why would anyone choose this sampling transect if one was studying, let's say, uh, soil insects or birds? Uh, yeah, not vegetation because uh, it is too artificial, but let's say soil insect or birds. It would be an, a good choice, this transect, because it goes into three different environments. This is a small mountain with trees, so here is in the uh, forested portion. This por portion is in town, and this is in the agricultural portion. <coughs> uh, you can see the fields there. So uh, at the broad scale along this transect, you may expect to have variation in the birds that you will observe or the insects that you will find because the environment is very different, right? So this is simply calling upon the environmental control or environmental filtering model that tells us that species have different uh, niche optima, so we might expect to have different species there, there, and there. Indeed, when you are designing uh, a a field sampling like this, you want to be sure that you will have variation. Variation is our friend. Imagine if you sample on a transect where there is no variation. What sort of a paper are you going to publish at the end? Nothing. So we need the variation. So when we plan the sampling, we have to make sure that there is variation. Now, you can also expect to have variation within the forested portion, within the town, and within the section in agricultural fields, because we know from experience that community composition is not exactly the same at all points along the transect, even if the environment is homogeneous in this portion, or that, or that. We may expect variation here due to other processes. It may not be uh, environmental differences. It may just be the, the dynamics of the community that will generate differences in species composition. So we invoke another part of our knowledge in ecology when we, s we say that we expect to have this sort of variation. And I will describe that a bit for more formally here. Uh, and there may be forcing by the explanatory variables, the environmental variables, and the, this, the environmental variables may be responsible for the spatial structures found in species assemblages. And we will call that induced spatial dependence, meaning that the spatial structure is induced by the dependence on the, of the species on the environmental variables. <coughs> that this is for the broad scale. But then community dynamics may also generate spatial structures, creating autocorrelation in the response variables. True autocorrelation is created by the response variables themselves, by their dynamics. And mechanisms can be the neutral processes that uh, have become uh, very popular since uh, 2001. Uh, since publication of different models called neutral models in ecology that are derived from the neutral models in genetics, by the way. So it can be these neutral processes <coughs> with mechanisms such as random drift and limited dispersal when species reproduce. Then for plants, the <coughs> seeds and so on may fall close to the parent or be carried some distance away by wind or by animals and so on, but there is still limited dispersal that create patches in species distribution. Same thing for animals. They may disperse a short distance away from the parents. There may be interactions among species that create also spatial structures. So these spatial structures generated by community dynamics are usually at more at finer scale than the spatial structures uh, generated by uh, the environmental variables. Not always, but in many cases they are at finer scales. Here's a summary picture that uh, summarizes the set of processes, at least some of the processes, 
that may be going on. This is actually a shorter picture from another picture with many more slices that is available at uh, the CTFS uh, <coughs> site, uh, the Smithsonian group that study entirely sampled forest, uh, where they have a lecture like that, like that with more slices. Uh, here you have a regional species pool. You can imagine that as the cloud that we are using now with uh, computers where we send data in the cloud. And then we get our data back from the cloud if we lose them. So you can imagine a cloud above an area with all the species in the cloud. Uh, and then some of the, these species from the regional species pool uh, <coughs> may have seeds or uh, young animals and so on available that comes into the area and uh, there will be the random sampling filter that is that some of the species will be available uh, and will pass through this filter and other species will remain in this regional species pool and uh, will not make it by random sampling from the regional species pool. Not all species, not if you are working with, with, uh, with vegetation, not, you don't have the seeds of all the species that fall at every one spot. There is random selection from the regional species pool by whatever process you may imagine. Then after that, there is an abiotic filter, again with vegetation, a seed falls here, it may germinate if the conditions are appropriate, or it may not germinate at all, because the conditions are not appropriate. So this would be the abiotic filters. Some species are stopped there. Others make it through. Then there is the biotic interaction filter that makes it possible for some species to survive, and others are stopped there. So from the original species pool and uh, in the local species assemblages, you end up with only a few species. Okay, so you have these different mechanisms that filter the species step by step. Uh, that's the general idea. Uh, then, uh, oh, I think I should uh, stop uh, very quickly. Well, there is a, a sort of simulation here in my uh, in the presentation <coughs> where I have four ponds. And uh, for, in which I have one species, Y, and one environmental variable, X. Uh, very quickly, <coughs> here in the null situation, the ponds are not connected, and uh, nothing much of interest happens. But this is the null situation, the null model, that serves as a comparison for all the other models. You could generate data like that by generating, for instance, a random deviate uh, and for species assemblages, they can be, uh, we, we can use the exponential distribution to generate data, and random exponential distribution to generate data like uh, the species composition for that species. And here for environmental data, you can use a random normal distribution, for instance, to generate data that look like that. But then things may differ. If you add uh, the idea that the environmental conditions have an influence on the species. So here, <coughs> if you have that, the basic information is what kind of data, uh, values you have in the environmental variable in each of these ponds. And that will condition the species assemblage. And you can an analyze that using a regression equation, where you will say that uh, the value y uh, let's say here, is a function, the linear function of the values of x plus some random component. <coughs> uh, the next model here, model 3, does not have this vertical uh, arrow. It simply says we open the gates here in the channels connecting the ponds, and we say that some water may flow from pond to pond, carrying individuals, if you are looking at uh, zooplankton or phytoplankton, some of the plankton from that pond may flow into this one. Some of the, the plankton from this may flow there, and so on. So that will create autocorrelation in the data. 
by direct flow of individuals from that bond to that bond. And then the equation modeling it is very different. It simply says that the value here depends on the value there with the regression coefficient plus some ran random innovation <coughs> due to the, the composition in that bond which is there. So this is very different from a regression equation. The next model is to say that we have this process of autocorrelation in the x plus transfer of the influence of x into the y. This leads to a bit more complex <coughs> simulation equation where you will have this sort of equation to, uh, to model values of x and then the regression equation that we had at the top to model this influence. And finally, what we have in real data is a composite of these two last models. That is, we may have x that is autocorrelated and influences y, but y that is also autocorrelated. So generating data like that can be done with these equations. But when we have real data and we don't know what are the processes at work, we may have to uh, do analysis to separate the influence of x on y from the autocorrelation in the y's. And we will explain tomorrow how this can be done. But it is based on the, essentially on the idea that in many cases, the spatial structures found among the Ys due to autocorrelation are at finer scale than the influence of the X on Y because X is generally, uh, <coughs> generally has a spatial structure at broader scales. So by doing a multi-scale analysis, we may be able to dis distinguish partially the influence of X on Y from the influence of the random processes, random uh, neutral processes going on in the Ys. So the sort of analysis that we'll explain tomorrow allows us to do that for the first time. And this is why we will describe them to you. It may give you ideas for your own analysis.